There's been a lot of other major courtroom action with wide-ranging implications today as well. In the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse, he's the then 17-year-old who shot three people, killing two during a Black Lives Matter protest in Kenosha, Wisconsin. The judge dismissed the misdemeanor weapons charge against him today, which, by all accounts, was the charge on which he was most likely to be convicted. Wisconsin law bans anyone under 18 from even carrying the type of AR-15-style rifle he used in those shootings, but the judge cited an exception to the law related to hunting for the dismissal. Hunting? So while Rittenhouse may avoid accountability for his actions, two other high-profile men are finally facing consequences for theirs. The first, conspiracy theorist and internet radio provocateur Alex Jones, who as of today has been found liable on every defamation charge brought against him by the families of 10 first graders who were murdered at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut over the harassment they've endured by Jones and his sycophantic followers. Harassment one parent described a front line a while ago and shared what I should warn was a disturbing example. Anything they can do to trigger trouble in my life, they have done. I got a call from someone and I had just moved into new a new apartment. He read me the address that I had just moved into and he read me my social security number. You're going to die, you mother a Connecticut judge essentially declared Jones guilty by default today for refusing to turn over court order documents, and that decision, along with three previous rulings in Texas, make four legal wins for the families whom Jones, for years, accused of being actors in a government-led plot to confiscate Americans' guns. Of course, despite the horror of that shooting and my own naive belief that it might actually lead to some action, this country still has not passed any meaningful gun reform nearly a decade later. But next year, juries in Connecticut and Texas will decide how much Jones will have to pay these families for putting them through even more hell after the deaths of their children. As for the other man finally getting at least some of what he had coming to him, that would be former Trump advisor Steve Bannon, who turned himself into the FBI today after he was indicted for ignoring a congressional subpoena from the House committee investigating the deadly January 6th attack on the Capitol. Bannon could get anywhere from two months to two years in prison if convicted on the contempt charges, which both Democrats and Republicans on the committee push for. One of the reasons that I voted to, uh, to hold uh, Steve Bannon in contempt was he didn't cooperate at all. Well, I'm very glad the Justice Department has moved forward in this fashion. As am I. Next up, it was 15 years ago that Brown University first released its landmark Slavery and Justice Report, which documented how the school's founder and others who helped build up the school profited from the slave trade. It laid out recommendations for the university to move forward from its past and also started conversations at higher education institutes across the nation about their complicated histories with race and slavery. Now, 15 years later, Brown is releasing a follow-up report with new insights into the original findings and new assessments as to how far the university has come and how far it has to go to address and make up for its past. Joined now by one of the editors of the second edition report, Anthony Bogues. He's the director of Brown's Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Anthony Bogues, it's very good to meet you. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you very much for asking. What caused President Simmons 15 years ago to commission this first report? I think as she said very clearly in the interview, which is published in the second edition, that she, when she arrived on campus as the first African-American uh, president of the of Ivy League University, uh, she was trying to find out what was the real history of the university. She had heard rumors that the, or heard stories that the university had connections to the Atlantic slave trade. She had tried to find information on this and she couldn't. And so she felt that the, uh, what she had to do, one of her responsibilities was really to just try and find the historical truth of this. So she established this committee uh, to investigate the relationship of the university to the Atlantic slave trade. And then uh, three years later, in 2006, we produced a report. So as she said in the interview, 
It was really uh, her response to a simple question. What was the relationship of the university to the Atlantic slave trade? Which she couldn't find the answer for mm -hmm. in the university. And then she thought, okay, we, we need to have, we need to do this. And just to be, uh, just the tip of the iceberg, the Brown brothers, I think four of them, among others, obviously were involved in the slave trade. In this second report, from what I understand, it's revealed that she got a lot of blowback for having decided to make this effort. Of what kind, of what nature? The blowback, uh, as she said in, again in the second edition, in the interview, which we did together, is that uh, it wasn't so much from the Brown community, either from the corporation or from Brown alums or from the university community itself but was really from outside of the university, um, where, uh, where many individuals felt that a university like Brown should not be doing this, that certainly she as an African-American should not be doing this, um, and, that what we, and that what she was doing was pandering um, to, uh, to, you know, to a, a whole set of people who were, to use a phrase that people use today, were politically correct. Mm -hmm. So in the intervening years between the two reports, what did Brown do? Obviously, they created your center. We, we know that. What other things did Brown do to move the proverbial ball forward? Well, we, the university established a memorial, uh, which is a significant memorial uh, commemorating the, the relationship between the university and the Atlantic slave trade. And it sits on one of the most prominent places on campus. Um, the university, um, in the last few years, created something called a, a DIAP, which is a Diversity and Action, mm -hmm. uh, Diversity and Inclusion and Action Plan, which um, which seeks to uh, which seeks to th think about uh, the representation of African Americans, of Native Americans, of women um, on the on the faculty, um, as well as in the student body. The university also did some, uh, made a significant contribution to Providence Public School, fulfilling one of the recommendations of the report. And I think what the report did was that it opened um, a door, really set up set a ground mm -hmm. for the university going forward to always be thinking about how do we tackle this question of historical injustice and the way in which his, the legacies of historical injustice um, are, are show themselves in today's society and obviously at the university. So in other words, it creates a framework for the university to be, always be thinking about this. As you know, in March of this year, months before the second <laughs> report was released, there was a poll of the student body at Brown. I just want to put up the results to two ballot questions. One was a call for the university to identify descendants of enslaved Africans affiliated mm -hmm. with the University of the Brown family. 89%, as you see, of the students supported that. Second question was a call for the school to provide reparations to identified descendants of slaves entangled with and or afflicted by the university and the Brown family. That did practically as well getting 85% support. What does the second report say about reparations? Um, the this, this second report is does not say anything about reparations specifically because the second report is really a republication of the first report. Um, what is different in the second, in the second edition of the report, so it's not really a second report, this in, in, is what is important about the second edition is that it actually is uh, more complete in the sense of thinking about context and as well as the ways in an impact. That is the ways in which that the first report of 2006 uh, impacted not just United States universities, but uh, universities around the world. And also thinks about the business of you know, what's the context in which we actually began to do this work. So it's a more complete report because the report was just a report without any context. It was just saying, this is what we're, you know, Understood. we're asked to do this, this is what we're doing. Now you raise the question of uh, reparations and the question of reparations is extremely important if you are, if one is thinking about the business of repair. Um, it's if you see slavery, racial slavery as a, one of the most profound historical injustices, then you have to think about, okay, how do we do repair? 
the position, the university has not got a position on reparations or one aspect of reparations, which is of a certain kind of monet, uh, of, of questions of monetary um, you know, distribution in some way. What, we, what, they, what I think needs to happen um, is that there needs to be a really major conversation between the university, the students, and the community in which we exist, which is the community of Providence in the state of Rhode Island, around these questions of repair and what does it mean. First, and I'll tell you why, because we also, the university also um, uh, exists on indigenous people's land. Yeah. So that the question of repair is, 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 is a larger question of how to think about where you are, in what community you are in, what is it that you do as an institute of higher education, and then how can we begin to have conversations so that we can all begin to think about what does repair really look like. That to me is, is a next step that university needs to begin to think about. Just so I understand a, a, a little bit, if I may, I mean, I'm aware, and you know much better than I, Georgetown, for example, when we hear legacy admissions, we generally think of the uh, children of rich white families. Right. They identified 272 slaves who were sold to pay off the debt of Georgetown in the early 1800s. They have provided legacy admissions for the descendants of those 272, as you know. The state of Virginia has said its five public colleges have to provide, quote, tangible benefits, whatever that means. Is that the kind, are those the kinds of directions you see Brown going in in the future? Let me put it, let me put it this way, that what the, the university is moving in a direction in which what it is we are developing a set of programs in which there will be need blind admissions right across the board. That's the first thing. Secondly, we, we are going to be paying attention, and the university president just uh, announced this a couple of weeks ago. We are going to be paying attention to the kids in the Providence public school system, the Rhode Island public school system. Um, one of the things that we have, one of the structural difficulties in, 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 the, in, the, in, uh, in Rhode Island is that, you is that if you go to a private school in Rhode Island, you can come to Brown, you know, uh -huh. you, uh, right? But if you go to the public schools, um, most of the public schools is not likely that Brown is on your mm -hmm. horizon. And so that, that, in my view, has to be corrected. That's, that's you, the university has to think about how, what is its relationship to the community in which it exists? Now, the thing with the, what the Georgetown folks were able to do, which I think is important, is that they were able, because they had a bill of sale from the Jesuit priest that said, these are the names of the slaves. Yes. 200 or not. They would say, okay, let's find those descendants. What, 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 is, what, is, what I've said, what I think is important here at Brown, is, a, is can we find those names of the slaves uh, who were on those ship? That's a lot of work to do, and that, that is not an impossible work. But I think the, 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 the two the voyages that the Brown brothers made, particularly John, but, uh, but, more, but also, can we begin to think of the ways in which we can correct and, cr and create situations in which uh, the kids of uh, African Americans, uh, the kids of Latinx folks, uh, the kids of the indigenous people mm -hmm. in this particular state, can they come to Brown? What kind of pipelines can we have so that, they can do it, so that Brown is on their horizon? Anthony Bogues, I hope you stay in touch with us. We're very interested in your work, and thank you for your time tonight. Thank you very much.